Just like everything in life, hockey has been evolving since day one. And while some changes were directly implemented and mandated, others have been more subtle and have been the product of circumstance. In this video, we're going to do something a little different and go over three types of players in the game that could eventually disappear entirely. And with that, here are three types of players in the NHL that could one day be gone forever. When Matthew Kachuk shook the hockey world by deciding to sign with the Florida Panthers, many weren't only shocked at the move itself, but rather what the Panthers GM, Bill Zito, said about him. Shortly after coming to terms with Kachuk and signing him to an 8-year, $76 million deal, Zito called Kachuk a generational talent. Many were skeptical as to why Kachuk, who is the same age as Austin Matthews and a year younger than Connor McDavid, would be given such an honor to start. The fact of the matter is that while Kachuk may not be the most offensively gifted out of them all, he's extremely valuable because he's an anomaly. Not only can he be effective on the score sheet, but Kachuk has a bite to his game and an aggressiveness about him that's infectious. And back during the Wayne Gretzky era, this was very common. Even thinking back to Gordy Howe, who was Gretzky's idol, Howe implemented the also famous Gordy Howe hat trick, which was a unique combination of scoring a goal notching an assist, and dropping the gloves. Usually, every team had a plethora of players that could hold their own, and sprinkled in were the star players that demanded protection. And this type of player does indeed have a name, power forward. Also, the name is obviously indicative of power itself, and in this case, the tendency to drop the gloves when need be. When pondering who comes to mind for me anyways, it's Tom Wilson. Even though Kachuk definitely likes to scrap, Wilson is routinely dropping the gloves with the biggest heavyweights around. Similarly to Kachuk, Wilson is also known as an anomaly, or even a unicorn, as he's brought back what it truly means to be an old school hockey player with physicality, but at the same time, he's offensively gifted. Most of us can remember just how Wilson exposed the New York Rangers team last year. Since Brennan Lemieux was traded away, it left the roster vulnerable and allowed for Wilson to get away with what he did. Even though Wilson and Kachuk aren't alone in the league, their breed is dwindling fast, which is leaving room for the smaller, faster, and more skilled players to take over instead. While this one probably isn't as noticeable as the last, there's definitely been a trend. Thinking back to defensemen that dominated the league at the millennium start, even to the 2010s, the average build was a much bigger one. The idea was that the taller the D-man, the longer the reach he'd have to intercept pucks. And also, the bigger the frame, the more power behind the slap shot there was likely to be. Zidane Chara, Dustin Bufflin, and Chris Pronger all were impactful in the past and had the ability to use their size to check the opposition and knock them off the puck. And while taller players on the back end still exist, such as Victor Hedman and Brent Burns, there's a new trend in the making. Due to, again, skill prevailing over size, there's been a new wave of talent introduced more recently in the hockey world. Adam Fox, Quinn Hughes, and Kale McCarr have all been impactful players early into their careers, two of which have won the Norris Trophy. Interestingly, they all have something in common. They're under six feet tall. In today's game, the emphasis seems to be more on how effectively defensemen can skate and puck handle. This allows them to move more effectively and keep up with the opposition, create turnovers, and move up in the play. But that's definitely not to say that there still aren't bigger D-men out there raising through the ranks. Instead, as the position evolves, players have to evolve along with it. Years ago, I did a specific video on this very subject, which was a similar attempt to answer the question as to why all the enforcers were leaving the game. Well. Since 2017, when the video was published, fights per game have decreased even more. Throughout the 2017-18 season, about 22% of games played had a fight within. And using the most recent data that I could find, throughout the 2020-21 season, there was only an 18% chance that a fight would break out. In case you're new to hockey or just need a refresher, fighting used to be a very integral part of the game. The whole going to see a fight in a hockey game broke out saying was much more relevant. Back nearly 20 years ago, throughout the 2001-2002 campaign, 
an astounding 42% of contests featured fisticuffs. And while it's almost human nature to try and narrow it down to one single cause, in this case, there's multiple contributors. While rule changes and officiating are definitely to blame, one of the bigger reasons is likely due to how taxing the role is on the body, and specifically the brain. After a trio of NHL enforcers passed unexpectedly in 2011, the publicity and the dark cloud that hovered over the league could have prompted the noticeable decrease in fighting majors around that same time to begin. Also, as Commissioner Gary Bettman also previously noted, as the game continues to become more competitive, the demand for more versatile players has never been higher. Unlike the typical goon that was around to simply drop the gloves that we used to know, now has been replaced with, as we mentioned before, a type of player that can score as well. But for now, there's still that last wave suiting up that's a representation of the past, such as Ryan Reeves, for example, that are mostly around just to keep the opposition in check. In closing, I'd like to take this time to thank all of my patrons for their support. If you're interested in supporting me and my work, plans begin at just a dollar a month. As always, there will be a link below if you'd like to learn more.